last week where we finished off in Genesis chapter 2, we saw a glorious creation, sun, moon, stars, solar systems, created by God, working in perfect harmony by a gloriously genius creator. We saw all varieties of animal species who not only were amazing in and of themselves, but also operated in full harmony with each other and with the caretakers they were, that were set over them, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. The ecosystem was perfect. The weather was perfect all the time. This was an ideal arrangement. You had two perfect people in a perfect place living out a perfect plan from a perfect a supremely perfect creator. There was only one home, one household, and it was perfect. There was no sin or conflict. There was no fear on earth. There was no insecurity. There was no pain, no stress, no troubling thoughts or nagging problems. Maybe best of all, there was no death. Or anything that could cause death. Why? Because sin wasn't here. And as Genesis chapter 2 turns to Genesis chapter 3, we see this perfect, glorious, beautiful arrangement. The creation of God come crashing down as a result of sin chosen by the first humans, our first parents. We're going to study the whole chapter. I'd like to just first start by reading the first 15 verses together with you, if you'll follow along while I read out loud. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. This is the world's first lie. Then the serpent said to the woman, "Uh, You will not surely die. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God. This is the world's first empty promise, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said unto him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Fear is now here. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? God is not asking questions because he doesn't know the answer. God is not looking for information. He is inviting Adam and Eve to confess. He is appealing to their conscience in a way that forces them to acknowledge their sin. By the way, sin can never be remedied until it's first acknowledged and confessed. So the Lord God said to the serpent, verse 14, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is a real story that really happened. And Adam and Eve's sin shows us so much. It was the first sin. They were our first parents. 
we follow after them in our tendencies. And what we learn is, number one, how to get into sin and how to avoid it. And then the great consequences and destruction that sin brings and how that God is always one step ahead of us with a remedy for that sin to rescue us from the eternal mess that we in our sin create. I think before we get into it, we need to answer one question that almost always is asked when you turn to Genesis 3, and that is, why did God let all this happen? Why, why even put the tree in the garden? Why let the serpent in? Why not interrupt him? And when the security cameras alerted him that the serpent was slithering toward Eve, why not, if God knows everything, why not just intervene and prevent this from happening? Why didn't God prevent this? And the answer is is simple, even though it's really hard to get our minds around, and that is that God wanted a love relationship with mankind. And unless you are free not to love, you don't have the capability of demonstrating love. Forced love is not love. So Adam and Eve were given the opportunity to reject Him through disobedience so they could demonstrate love and loyalty, and worship through obedience. You see, God had created Adam and Eve in a way that He didn't create any of the rest of creation. He created them as moral agents. This is what it, part of what it means to be made in the likeness of God. They could choose between good and evil. They were more than just the rest of creation operating on animal instinct. They were moral creatures. And they could choose good and evil. Why did God create them like this? Because He wanted a connection with them that was based on loyalty and loving obedience. Why did God let evil in? He didn't. God let freedom in. We let evil in. And before you get too hard on Adam and Eve and too frustrated at them, you and I have enough life experience and track record of our own to know what we may have done in their situation. Do you think we would have sinned? I think we have evidence that says we would have. One of the amazing things to me about this whole chapter is that before any of it occurred, God knew beforehand how it would play out in perfect knowledge. And though God isn't the author of evil, He was not surprised by evil, nor was He unprepared for it. What do we learn from Adam and Eve's failure and our own? And what does it mean to us? Well, first of all, we learn from Adam and Eve the pathway to sin. And if we understand the the pathway to sin, maybe maybe we can avoid it. What is the pathway to sin that Eve and then Adam followed? Look in verse number one, and it's pretty obvious. What were the first words out of Satan's mouth as he occupied the body of a serpent and then spoke to Eve? What were the first words? Has God said? The first thing that will lead you to sin and Satan's first strategy in the lives of all people is to cause them to question God's Word. The next thing that happens in verse number 4 is that Satan replaces God's truth with his own lie. You know, Satan has his own counterfeit message every single time. God calls us to things. God calls us away from things. Satan's always going to come alongside of the message of Scripture and going to offer us a lie to replace the truth. By the way, that's why you need to be a student of the Word. If you're not a student of the Word, you're not going to know what God's truth is or be able to identify what Satan's lies are. And so he says in verse 4, you're not going to die. He's lying to Eve. John 8.44, Jesus said that we shouldn't be surprised by that because He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. There was no truth in Him. When He speaks a lie, He speaks of His own, for He is a liar and the father of it. We need to learn that this is how Satan operates so that we can live off the pathway of sin on the pathway of righteousness. Paul told the believers in Corinth that it was his desire that Satan would not take advantage of them and so that they would not be ignorant of his devices. One of the other paths to this sin was that Eve questioned, or Satan caused her to question, God's goodness. 
When you see the wording of the devil here, he says, God knows what you're going to get if you eat that tree, and he doesn't want you to have it. A big part of Satan's lies to lure you to sin is to tell you that God is withholding something good for you that he wants you to experience that God has forbidden you from, and it's all a big lie. He lured her with an empty promise. And and remember, please, that whenever Satan puts a temptation in front of you, the, the appeal of the promise is always empty, it always stings in the end, and it is never what it was set out to be. In verse 6, we learn that he appealed to this trio of human desires. There are three pieces of the human desires that existed in Eve as a human that Satan now appeals to in verse number 6 and that Eve falls subject to. Look at verse 6. You might want to mark some of these words in your Bible and maybe write something down in the margin or in your notes. In verse 6, it says, The woman saw that the tree, number one, was good for food, and number two, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and number three, that it was desired to make one wise. That's a really important trifecta of temptation. I would think that every sin you could fall prey to would probably fall into one of these three varieties. And, and what are these varieties? Well, we, we learn in 1 John. Centuries later, the Apostle John wrote 1 John to Christians, calling them away from sin, and quite possibly with, with Eve's example in his mind, he says to them in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, now he's going to say three things that are in the world that we're not to love or to follow after. The lust of the flesh, number one. The lust of the eyes, number two. And the pride of life, number three. These are not of the Father, but of the world. The lust of the flesh, you might want to mark that expression. The lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those three warnings match up with the description in Genesis 3.6 of what Eve was lured to. The, f- the lust of the flesh would be physical desires. Lust of the eyes, material desires. Pride of life, psychological desires. Lust of the flesh, you could call the, l- the desire for pleasure. Lust of the eyes, you could call the desire to possess. Lust, uh, pride of life, the desire for power or status. The lust of the flesh says, I want to experience that. The lust of the eye says, I want to have that. But the pride of life says, I want to be that. And in our desire for physical satisfaction, in our desire to amass possessions, and in our desire to be something in our pride, we fall prey to sin. I share this with you so that we might have the blinders removed and so that when satan comes alongside of us as he did even tempts us towards something we might see it for what it is and we might recognize the lie and we might not fall prey to the lure of satan the other thing we learn from eve here is that her sin led to someone else's sin she gave it to her husband and he ate now god held adam accountable for his sin but it's a reminder to us that we rarely sin alone. Some people say, and they'll excuse sin by saying, well, it's not hurting anybody else. Is Genesis chapter 3 not a powerful example of how all sin affects other people? First her spouse and then the entire human race. Paul told the church in Corinth that it was he was concerned that they would not as Eve was deceived by the serpent through his craftiness, so your minds would be corrupted. It's a concern that we would fall for the lies that Adam and Eve fell to. Is there an area in your life where you're being tempted to question what God's Word clearly says? Or where you're being tempted with a lie from the devil? Is the devil creating some dishonest narrative in an attempt to lead you to sin? Do you feel that God's withholding good from you and you're going to step out of bounds because you deserve it or you're entitled to it? Is there a way that the devil is appealing to the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life in your life? James 1.14 says that we each are tempted when we are drawn away of our own desires and enticed. This is the pathway to sin. And the best way to stay off of it 
is to learn what it's done to others and us and to avoid it and to see it for what it is. When we, when we see it for what it is, we can avoid being deceived. It's going to get worse before it gets better as we move through this chapter and as we move through this message. Because the next several verses reveal to us not only the pathway to sin, but also the consequences of sin. In verses 8 through 19, and then toward the end of the chapter, we see extraordinary consequences that Adam and Eve never could have fathomed. And, and it's interesting to me that before God even says a word to Adam and Eve in verses 7 through 10, you immediately see guilt, shame, and fear. There was no guilt, shame, or fear before sin, but that's what it brought. The aftertaste of this fruit was truly horrendous. I believe one of the greatest antidotes for temptation in my own life, and probably in yours as well, is a clear understanding of the consequences of sin. I've tried to think when temptation is in front of me of the consequences in my life and in the lives of those I love if I move forward toward that temptation. I haven't always succeeded. But knowing that there are consequences and the sobering tale of the consequences in Genesis 3 should be a great challenge for all of us to motivate us to run from sin as fast as we can and as far as we can. There are many people who through rationalization are wanting to live as close to sin as they can, but I think when you see its consequences, we will do what Paul told Timothy to do, flee sinful behavior. One of Satan's greatest lies is that you can sin and there won't be negative consequences. James 1.15 when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Sin always destroys. It will destroy relationships. It will destroy peace. It will destroy joy. It will destroy populations. I want you to notice as verses 8 through 15, which we've already read, unfold, that Adam and Eve are accountable to God. He comes to them. Every person who ever sins will answer to God for that sin. In verses 16 through 19, we see what God now says to them about their consequences. And these verses reveal to us a little bit about the world we live in. To the woman, he said, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the field. In the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Genesis 3 tells us that you and I live on a broken planet. It's broken by sin. It operates under a curse. And every day of your life and mine, we will brush up against the effects of this curse. Pain is introduced to the human race, verse 16. Relationships now will face conflict, verse 16. The ground will now produce thorns and thistles, making the, the effort to feed oneself and to care for this planet a painful, uh, damaging uh, fraught with injury experience. Man's work is now undertaken with toil, verse 17, and sweat, verse 19. The plants and the creation is now at odds with each other. We're being pricked by thorns and we're being threatened by the wild beasts because things are out of order. The, the natural course of life now stings as we engage it. Sin has been invited into the world. 
and suffering has ridden in with it. In verses 20 through 24, we see the greatest problem, and that is that Adam and Eve were expelled forever from the garden because sin is not tolerated in God's holy presence. God is so holy and so righteous, sin can't be in contact with Him, which, which by the way, is why every single one of us need a Savior. That's why Jesus Christ came to earth, because you know every one of us have the same problem. We are all sinners. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. All of us. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous. All of us have sinned, so all of us now, with Adam and Eve, are barred from God's presence unless, unless... God remedies it somehow. And we'll see how He does. But we have to understand the separation that sin causes. And that involves death. Both physical death and spiritual death. Don't rush past verse 19 where God says to Adam, you will return to the ground for out of it you were taken. That was not the case until sin. The God's opportunity for Adam was that he would live forever. He would have daily access to the tree of life and he would live forever in health and vitality. And yet now, God says, you will die. Physical death. There is a, a, a universal death among us. Uh, uh, by one man's sin entered the world, Romans 5.12, and death by sin. So, death passed on all men or all people. For all have sinned. There's a process taking place in our lives that will end with our death. Every single one of us have that in common. The mortality rate is 100% for the human race. Why? That began on the day the teeth of Adam and Eve were sunken into that forbidden fruit. And it doesn't just include physical death, but the Bible uses the word death to describe a spiritual eternal separation from God, which is far more consequential because of its eternalness. Revelation 20, 15, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and might I say, the far worse death. All of us will experience physical death, but the message of the Scripture is that because of the redemption of Christ, we don't have to experience the second death, eternal separation from God forever. I think a really important takeaway from Genesis chapter 3 for all of us is that whenever we see suffering, we need to understand it got here through sin. That is not to say when you suffer, it must mean you have sinned to cause that suffering. That's not the case probably most often. Now sometimes my sins have invited suffering into my life. But I would say, sometimes you, sin, you suffer because of your own sin. Sometimes you suffer because someone next to you sinned. You are literally the victim of someone else's sin. Every person in this room has experienced that. And then oftentimes, it's not you or someone next to you that sinned. It's just the fact that you are part of a sinful race and living on a planet that has been cursed by sin. And the thing that all of us should understand is that we contributed to that because we are a piece of this human race that has contributed to sin. I think Genesis 1-3 through 3, that we've studied the last two weeks in this will help us understand the world we live in. Genesis 1 and 2 help us understand the beauty of it and the glory of it. The amazing things that, that cause us uh, to adore our genius creator. Whether it's a child being formed in her mother's womb or whether it's some great uh, artistic accomplishment, or whether it's the solar system that we see at night, or whether it's some other kind of a thing. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2 show us the glories, the cause behind all of the glories that we see in this world, all the beautiful things that we see in this world. Genesis 3, though, helps us see the cause behind all of the hideousness and all of the ugly things in this world. Because of sin, we suffer. Hurricanes, part of being on a broken planet. Hatred, part of being part of a broken race. Hearing loss, part of having a broken body. War, 
worry? Funerals? Had there been no sin, there'd no, be no funerals. Fatigue? Car crashes? Cancer? Adultery? Alzheimer's? Shipwrecks? Nearsightedness? Violence? Dictatorships? Dishonesty? Mental illness? Misunderstandings? Insecurity? Anxiety? Lust? Greed? Dysfunctional relationships? Orphaned children? Abused children? Trafficked children and women? Abuse and substance abuse? And the list could go on, couldn't it? These are the effects of sin being present. The Bible repeatedly points us to this reality. Romans 8.22 We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in birth in pain together. <clears throat> Those moments just before a child comes into the world are some of the most excruciatingly painful and fear-inspiring desperation moments in the life of the mother giving birth. And he says that's what the whole creation is experiencing. The whole creation is experiencing a groaning that is, it is travailing in pain. <clears throat> and, and Paul says in verse 23 of Romans 8, and not only they, not just the whole world, but we ourselves also, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even Christians, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. The groanings of our earthly journey and the constant sense that you and I have that things are not right here is the consequence of living in a fallen world in the midst of a fallen human race. Now for the good news. What is the remedy for this sin? There is one. And we are introduced on page number two of my Bible to God's remedy for all of the sin and all of the suffering that has been unleashed over the last many thousands of years. I think the first thing we learn from Adam and Eve's story is that only God can remedy sin. We are powerless to do so. Adam and Eve's attempt was fig leaves. You know what happens to these leaves after they're detached from the tree, right? They're all over your yard. They crinkle up and become real, real ineffective as clothing. That's what our remedies for sin are. Insufficient, irritating, inadequate attempts at solving our problem. That's why the, the message of the Gospel of Christ is that only He can provide the full redemption for your sin. And that if you go about every other direction without Christ trying to solve your sin, you might jump through a lot of hoops, you might do a lot of religious stuff, you might turn over a new leaf, you might do a lot of good works, you might devote the rest of your life to trying to uh, dedicate it to yourself to good causes because you know you need to make remedy for the sins you've committed, but I will tell you, they are nothing more than fig leaves without the solution that can come only from God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is salvation in, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Notice that God initiates moving toward Adam and Eve. I hope it encourages you that in their lives, God moved toward them when they'd broken everything through sin, and in your life, He's made the first move too. He comes to seek and to save that which was lost. The redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross is God's only true remedy for sin. And this was conceived in the heart of God even before Adam and Eve sinned. Peter says in Acts 2.23 that Jesus was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. 
Revelation 13.8 says that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So before Genesis 1 creation, God already knew what would happen in the garden, what would be unleashed on the human race, and how sin could be remedied for all of eternity through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see two beautiful portraits of Jesus in this passage. Verse 21 is the first one I'd like you to see. Uh, God comes to them. And it says, God makes coats of skins and clothes them. You know, what's interesting. Their nakedness was not a sin. Genesis chapter 2 reveals that. But their nakedness was a fitting symbol of the insecurity caused by sin and the vulnerability that sin brings. So, so what happened? Don't miss this. Don't miss the metaphor in this, the symbolism in this. God initiated the death of an innocent animal so that they could be clothed with its skins. And what does that point us to? If not a Savior who was innocent, whose blood was shed so that the righteousness which He possessed could clothe us. That's what the New Testament tells us, is that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain to forgive sin, to take away sin, to cover, if you will, sin. When we come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, we're talking here about being saved. If you've heard of us talking about receiving Christ as your Savior, turning to God in repentance and faith, being saved, we're talking about this this coming into a relationship with God in response to His mercy that He's reached out toward you, in response to the message of the cross on Calvary and the resurrection of Jesus, when you come to faith in Christ, you get clothed in the righteousness that Jesus earned. You see, I mentioned earlier, everybody sinned, except for Jesus, because for 31 years, 33 years, Jesus walked this earth and lived the sinless life that you and I have failed to live. And He offers us a righteous record from Him to us. Romans 4 says it can be imputed to us. That means applied to us. That means we can be clothed in His perfection. That's the terminology that the New Testament uses. So that when we come before God, we're not naked and sinful. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We come to God. The only hope for us coming to God in prayer or one day through death The only way we could be welcomed in His presence is if we, like Adam and Eve, are clothed by what God has provided, the righteousness that Jesus Christ has given us. In 1834, the hymn writer said, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And then the verse goes on to say, When He shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in Him be found. Now listen to the rest of this song. Dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless I'll stand before His throne. None of us are prepared to stand before the throne of God without the righteousness of Jesus Christ robing us. And we receive that by faith through the new birth. There's another beautiful picture of Jesus in this chapter. It is the first mention of the gospel, and it's on page two of your Bible, Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity, that's opposition, eneminess, between you and the woman, Satan, and between your seed, that is all of those who follow Satan, and his his, uh, minions who had followed him out of heaven, his powers and principalities, the the demons, the fallen angels. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. The New Testament tells us who God was referring to here. He was referring by saying her seed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If you study the New Testament, you discover that this last half of Genesis 3.15 is a loud and clear prophecy of what happened on the day that Jesus died. He was wounded on that cross for us. Satan bruised his heel. The word bruise really can mean crush. And when you bruise your heel, you can recover from that. But if you crush your head, that's a mortal wound. There's no recovering from that. 
And that's why this language is so important because God says to Satan, you will bruise her seeds heel, but he will bruise, he will crush your head. You may injure the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Nails will be driven through his hands. Thorns will be thrust into his brow. Nails will be uh, driven through his feet. A spear will be thrust into his side. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. You will crush his heel, but he will crush your head because the cross of Calvary was the final death blow inflicted on the destroyer for us so that he doesn't have to have victory over us, so that we can live free from sin, Romans chapters 4 through 8, so that we can live in a way that is not bound by sin, dragging us to hell, but we can be freed from that because Jesus has won the victory over Satan. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers, Colossians 2.15, making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, that is his cross. And Jesus' death on the cross was his taking the curse for us in his own body and soul. When Jesus spoke of the cup <clears throat> that he would drink in during his prayer in John chapter 17 in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was speaking <clears throat> of the wrath of God coming down upon him. Jesus became a curse for us, Galatians 3.13, so that we could be redeemed or freed from the curse. So the curse that brought separation from God and ultimate death to the human race, beginning with Adam and Eve, Jesus has stepped in between us and swallowed that curse in for all who come to faith in Him. My sin puts me in the crosshairs of the righteous wrath of a holy God who will destroy every sin, who will judge every sin. By the way, a good judge doesn't let sin go. A good, shun, a good judge levels punishment out on sin. And so my uh, sin puts me in the crosshairs of the wrath of a holy judge who will er one day eradicate all sin by judging all sin. And Jesus steps between me and those crosshairs and takes the curse for me and for you on the cross and for every person who will come into him. You see, when you stand before God, if you're in Christ, your penalty has already been paid. The curse has already been taken for you by Jesus. That's why it's called the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. God demonstrates his love toward us while we were sinners. Christ died for us. And so what Jesus does is Jesus becomes the one who rescues us. He becomes the one man, the better Adam, the new beginning of a new family, a new race of descendants who are righteous. Jesus becomes the one who allows us by coming into him and under his heirship to remove and to eradicate the curse that all of us experience by being under Adam. Adam's headship. Look at Romans 5, 18 and 19. As by one man's offense or sin, judgment came to all men. That's referring to Adam's sin. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's Jesus, the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam's, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. We are made righteous, not because we achieved it, but because He's granted it to us and we can stand before God knowing that Jesus has rescued us. In Adam, everyone dies, but in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15.22, all can be made alive. And I have to emphasize one more thing before we're finished. Because Jesus' redemption was not just so that you don't have to go to hell. Although, that's a great benefit. He died so that you and I could experience a future life in His kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth where the curse has no effect.
Revelation tells us that there is a coming a day when believers in Christ will not just experience God's presence in heaven forever, but much more than just heaven. We will experience a world made right. We read Romans 8, 22 and 23, but we didn't finish verse 23, so let's look at it. Verse 23, ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for, we're waiting for something, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. There are many ways in which God will provide grace and mercy and blessings throughout the course of this life, but there will also be many ways in which we have to wait for the final redemption of all the suffering and of all the wounds that we encounter during the course of living a sin-filled life on a sin-filled planet. Isaac Watts wrote the song that we will sing this Christmas, Joy to the World, in 1833, but he didn't write it as a Christmas song. He wrote it as a song that was intended to anticipate the return of Christ and Christ's millennial kingdom. That's why it says, let earth receive her king. And then the, the, one of the verses in the song says, think about this, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Isaac Watts understood the New Testament message of the new heaven and the new earth and the new kingdom and the new experience that all will have where every single piece of suffering was corrected. What would it be like, what will it be like to experience a place where not only is there no death and no disease and no pain and no sin, and not only are you in the presence of the one who loved you and created you and redeemed you and has affection for you and has provided this for you at great cost to himself, not only do you know that it will never end, but it's like an ever-expanding dream coming true, but also that every thing that ever caused you to groan, everything that ever caused you to wince, everything that ever caused you pain is not just forgotten. No, no. It is redeemed. It is turned inside out and right side up and contributes to the glory we experience. That's why Paul said that the sufferings of this present time are not to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. I wish, uh, I wish we could prevent suffering. And as we, as we are agents of God's grace and mercy in this world and as we are salt and light in this world, there are many ways where Christians can bring relief to this broken world. But we will never eradicate it fully, will we? It breaks my heart to see precious Christians suffer. Some of you have been hurt so deeply. Some have endured such heavy grief. Some of you have had wounds inflicted upon you that while God does have grace for you now, will never be fully redeemed or corrected. There are wrongs that will never be made right this side of heaven. So many have suffered abuse things that will not be forgotten. So many have been betrayed by someone they did nothing but love. So many of you have lost a loved one or a number of loved ones, a spouse, a child, a sibling. And you're suffering because you know this one has gone before, long before it should have been. What we need to know from Genesis 3 and the New Testament's message about it is that Christ's work on the cross is the only full antidote for living in a broken world. His future promise of the full removal of the curse and His redemption of all the things inflicted upon us by the fall has been provided through Jesus. In his book, The Reason for God, Tim Keller says it this way, the biblical view of things is resurrection. Not a future that is just a consolation for the life we never had, but a restoration of the life you always wanted. This means that every horrible thing that ever happened will not only be undone and repaired, but will in some way 
make the eventual glory and joy even greater. We will get the life we most longed for, but it will be infinitely more glorious than if there had never been the need for bravery, endurance, sacrifice, or salvation. This is the ultimate defeat of evil and suffering. Have you figured out yet that we're not going to be able to craft this perfect life for ourselves here? That as hard as we try, and I've been trying for years, as hard as we try to line everything up and set everything up and get everybody to cooperate for our, with our plan for their lives, we, we can't. It's never going to be perfect. We're, we're, we're chasing something that's elusive when we chase perfection here on earth. But one day, what we groan for, what we know we're falling just short from, will be experienced by every person in Christ. Just after the climax of the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings, uh, Sam discovers that his friend Gandalf was not dead like he thought he was, but is alive. And so he cries out, he says, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. And then he says this, is everything sad going to come untrue? And the answer to the New Testament to that question is yes. Everything sad for every person in Christ will come untrue. And there will be a greatness and a glory that we will experience that will be greater for having endured what was broken and lost here. C.S. Lewis said that they say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can ever make up for that. But they're not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. Now, there's nothing you and I can do about the fact that in Genesis chapter 3, paradise was lost. But does that mean we're living out God's plan B? No. No. God has designed an eternity that's even better upon arrival for having gone through this. God's designing and has prepared for us. Eye has not seen, neither has ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. He is preparing a place because what the Scripture tells us as it unfolds in the coming chapters and books is that the fall led to suffering, but the suffering led to a Redeemer. And the Redeemer led to a bride for the Redeemer of whom you and I are a part. And that will lead to a marriage and a kingdom and a home which will be better and more glorious than Eden could have ever been had Adam and Eve not sinned. In a moment, we're going to pray. And when we pray, if you today discovered your need for Christ because of the consequences of sin, your own sin, I hope you'll whisper a prayer to the Lord from the seat you're in right now and say, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin and be my Savior. I acknowledge it to you like Adam and Eve had to acknowledge their sin before it could be dealt with. I ask you to forgive me and save me and give me your righteousness and enable me to stand before God one day. If you're unsaved, never come to Christ. He has saving grace for you. If you are saved, you still suffer the effects of sin, don't you? I do. Even though your, your soul has been saved from it and you have been freed from its bondage, you're bumping up against it in your own life and the lives of others all the time. God has grace for you, too. He has mercy for you, too. You're groaning, but He has grace. And I, I would say that as we pray today, we should unite our hearts in a plea for God's mercy and grace and asking Him to bring His redemptive work into every corner of our lives and make us agents of His grace in this broken world. Can we pray together? Lord, thank you for reaching out to us and not leaving us to ourselves. The moment Adam and Eve bit into that fruit, the human race could have been eradicated and destroyed. Never again to be created. But that wasn't your heart. Your heart is the heart of a redeemer. Your heart is the heart of a saving rescuer. And we praise you for this. We praise you for this. Please bring your mercy and grace to the places where sin has inflicted such suffering on such precious, precious people in this room and in this world. 
Please make us agents of grace. Use us to bring mercy and help where we find the effects of sin. And please strengthen us. Strengthen our faith. 